Good evening and welcome back to the last session of day two at Dhaka Media Summit 2022. In this session, we are to engage in a book discussion entitled Mobile Assemblages and Mendelio in Rural Kenya with Dr. Leah Zorup, Zorup Komen from Daystar University, Kenya. Uh, before we, into, we, we go into the discussion, uh, the conversation, let me introduce Dr. Leah Zerup Komen. Uh, she actually has many hats to wear. She is currently the deputy director at the Directorate of, uh, Directorate of Resource Mobilization, Projects and Partnerships at Daystar University, Kenya, but she also teaches in the School of Communication. Alongside Dr. Leah is an IMCR ambassador in Africa. Dr. Leah received her PhD from University of East London, United Kingdom in new media and development. Her research interests include the domestication of communication technologies in sub-Saharan Africa and how human technology and context interrelationships form part of social assemblages that intersect with development. She has two books under her credit. Her recent works include mobile telephony among rural people in Kenya. Dr. Leah started her career as a teacher of music and English and taught at various international schools, including the Netherlands, the Netherlands School, the Nairobi Japanese School, and the Swedish School in Kenya before she joined Daystar University as an adjunct in 2008 and later as a full-time faculty member. I think Dr. Leah's introduction will be incomplete without saying that she is a singer and have four albums under her credit. So let's listen to Dr. Leah's comment. Dr. Leah, I will uh, give the screen and mic to you. And yes, I will be here as the moderator of the session to assist you uh, in the conversation if necessary at all. Okay, so welcome and uh, good evening from Dhaka, Dr. Leah. The screen and mic are yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sakar. Is that how to pronounce your name? Sakar or Sarkar? Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you everybody for making time to be here. Um, I think I'll just go straight away to share my screen and then we'll get started. All right, so, um, so that's me. Uh, the names have been introduced, but today, let me just extend my gratitude to Ulab, <laughs> uh, Professor Jude, and of course, everybody who is here today for the opportunity to talk about this book. This book is an offshoot of my doctoral work. And so um, before I began writing this book, my intention was really like any other doctoral student, you just want to get papers out of it and then feel good that you are in class, you know. But as I presented the papers on different functions on different conferences, at least bits of it, uh, I got motivated by uh, the people I would call the gurus or the big brothers and sisters in the field. And as they listened to my work, they actually challenged me to put it in a book. And uh, for two reasons. One is because there is a um, limited uh, number of empirical work from my context. And number, uh, number two also, because it's a good thing to have these things circulated so that the stories can be heard from across the world. And so I took the challenge after being um, challenged to do so. Now, I come from Africa and in Africa, and I don't know whether it's the same in Bangladesh, there's usually a story before a story. So this is the story before a story. <laughs> before I talk to us about the book, um, I will take this as my outline. I'll give you my inspiration, why the book, and then I will try to give the conceptualization of development as argued in this book. And then I will talk to us about mobile telephony assemblages and Mayendeleo, 
Congratulations, uh, Sakar, for trying hard. My Leo, thank you so much. <laughs> and then why I think you should consider this book. Now on to the story before the story. Um, so like I said, I got to, to I got to be inspired or rather challenged by those people who've gone ahead of me to consider putting this in a book. Um, I come from a very uh, healthy family. <laughs> I come from a polygamous home. And so um, my dad has two wives, each wife has 10 kids. I am number 16 out of 20. So that means we have a football team and a coach <laughs> in our family, so to speak. And so uh, why am I giving the story of my background? Just to let you know that uh, scaling these stairs was not easy. Uh, thankful to God that this happened, but really number 16 was way behind. And I, I'm the only one actually uh, to have been able to do that, to have been able to do a master's and a doctorate and to have even gone out or abroad for this. So this is really, um, my degree is a community degree. So even this book, I consider a community book because it's the stories that are in there. I uh, was motivated by a couple of people. Uh, one is Alban Einstein, which all of us I'm sure are aware. And he said something, he said that life is like riding a bicycle. To keep your balance, you must keep moving. Although I noticed the kind of uh, um, limitations that I faced, this quote kept me going, knowing that for me to stay afloat, I must keep riding the bicycle to stay the balance. Then another one is by Whitman who says, keep your face always towards the sunshine and the shadows will fall behind you. This was very motivational for me because uh, notice I was in London, not in Kenya, and that in itself provided huge challenges in terms of how do you sustain yourself because I was a self-sponsored student. So having taken the, the, the loans and being away from the family, my husband stayed behind with two of our sons, uh, the only sons actually, that's 10 and seven at that time. And so I noticed if I was to be distracted and think about home so much, I may not finish. So I looked at the brighter side, that after I'm done with this degree, I'll be back home to be with them the longest time. And then success is not a final, failure is not fatal, it is the courage to continue that counts. Now that really was good because uh, those of us who are in the journey of PhD now or graduate students and even professors who could be in this meeting know how much <laughs> that makes sense. There are times you fail, so many failures before you actually get to the finish mark. The discouragements are not in short supply, but I just realized it is not final. I must keep continue. What counts is the courage to continue. And of course, uh, I'm, as a man thinker, so is he. It was a question of realigning my thoughts. What do I want? And that kept me going. So this is how the book appears, uh, Mobile Assemblages and Mindaleo in rural Kenya. You can get it at Amazon. Uh, yes, and also the, the publisher, which is Langa Publishing House. Now, I'll quickly take us through the conceptualization of development. Um, the term development, of course, from this context is not new because most of the world, after the World War II, there was a need to reestablish, the need to put things together after the ravages and, of course, the problems of war. So because of that, most of the approaches that came or spoke about modernizing people, they needed to be modernized to look civilized, so much so that to be developed then was equated to being civilized, to being modernized, to seeing better days, you know. And so the definition of development was really synonymous to modernization or civilization. Now, there is a problem with that kind of definition because um, if development is not defined by the people as they experience it themselves, there is a huge problem of dichotomizing the society so that we have you know, the have, the have-nots, the rich, the poor, we have the civilized and civilized. 
we have uh, the north and the south and these clusters continue today but i had a problem with that because i thought in my thinking and in my reading that when people experience technologies such as mobile telephony they have their own unique experiences that are most likely crafted in their day-to-day -day lives how they experience it how they domesticate it that is how they experience their own development and so in a sense this book uh, deviates from development as modernization but looks at development as co-created it is uh, uh, diachronic so that the, 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 the divisions will not be glaring because this will be defined by the people. Now, it, this kind of dichotomization, you will agree with me, does very little to show the dynamic influence of technologies and how users influences uh, such technologies. Because it's not just the technology that influences to some extent, the humans, the humans as they use it, also influence the structure of the technology, the improvement of the same, but this is also advised by the context from which they find themselves in. So that a mobile phone in a hand of one person would be a tool to show light. To another hand, it could be a weapon. So you need to, to, to alert people to come to the context if there's a problem. To another person, it could be so many things. But maybe before even I discuss mobile assemblages and, as, uh, and Mindeleo as it were, maybe a little bit introduction of the context. So the rural Kenya I speak of is, is Marakwet. Marakwet is in the western part of, of Kenya. Uh, there are things that are unique for the region. Um, the community structures are still heavy. So um, in terms of leadership, there's the clan leadership. So if you want to collect data, you must go through the gatekeepers. And mostly this will be the gate clan leaders. There's also the political structure. So we have the, the chief, uh, those who are representing the government and so on and so forth. But there is also the topography of the land is such a way that you have the people living on a hilly side, but down the hill is where they keep the animals. Uh, and, and largely these are attracted what they call cattle rustling among the neighboring communities. And as the cattle rustling is happening, destruction is left behind. Uh, there is the gender, uh, what do you call, female genital mutilation that is still being practiced uh, in some parts of this region. And therefore, the technology such as mobile phone finds a new use in terms of rescuing the girls or alerting the helpers to come and get them, or even pointing to where that has happened. So mobile assemblages and Mindeleo of course, mobile phones uptake is forever increasing in the global south. It is no longer a question of uh, who does not have the phone, but what kind of phone do you have? So this in itself has infiltrated every corner as people have used the mobile phone in different ways. The term assemblages appealed to me because it comes from a French term agentment, which speaks of the construction which is a layer of different interacting components to form a whole. So that the certain processes uh, make the identity of this whole either stronger or weaker. And these processes they call territorialization or deterritorialization. But there's also the real roles that the, the components play. So we have the components forming a whole, but this whole that is being formed, which is an assemblage is not rigid because it can be removed, parts of it can be removed and be connected to another and form a different assembly. So assembly theory uh, for social transformation therefore means development is not static, but dynamic. And it goes through different interaction as people use the technology, the kind of users using the technology within their context. So Mindeleo is a Kiswahili term uh, denoting uh, development that is diachronic and I'll come to speak about that. So it is, uh, it is a definition that problematizes uh, development as we have known it, which is synonymous to civilization, modernization, acquisition of infrastructure, and so on and so forth, but rather as experienced by the people. Now, 
Assembly theory, therefore, for browser development or transformation as a continuous process rather than as one effect and invites us to understand change by moving away from close totalities. So this book sees social transformation through assemblages tenets. There is the roles, which is the material role. If you see the mobile phone, that garden itself, the device itself plays a material role. So does the people who are using it because they are tangible. But then there is also the expressive roles. Uh, if you look at your phone, there are a number of things that you have enabled. Either it's your phone to be a screensaver, your photo to be your screensaver, could be a fantastic uh, view of your home, something that says something about you, that expression. Uh, but in the users also, the express, expressive role comes alive. Then there are the, the, the processes of territorialization and deterritorialization. What Assembly just says is what when, when, when we decide, as we use the mobile phone, for example, how we communicate, we decide who gets into the inner core. And in our own mobile phones, we have that. Maybe in your phone, you have decided I'm not picking number X, but I'll pick, I'll pick Y. So it is you who have decided. The others, you decided to ring until the four, four, fourth round or the fifth round, the others, you pick quickly, depending on the closeness you have with the, the person calling. But it doesn't mean that the person who you have put in the inner circle will forever be in the inner circle. Some other factors can come from external that will make this person maybe stop being a friend that was a friend then you kick them up to the periphery, they become acquaintance. Then another one can come in. So these are not uh, rigid, they are fluid. Then there is something called emergence in assemblage theory, which is really something new coming about as there's an interaction between components. In the mobile phone, as we will say shortly, as the people begin to use the mobile phone, they would have different news, uh, reasons for purchasing. People would go and buy the phone because we know it's a communication gadget. At least that's what we knew. But when you ask the people in my context, and I'll be talking about that, why they would go to the shop first of all and buy a mobile phone, the, 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 the reasons are varied. And because of the realities I've just spoke, uh, talked to us about, some will go and buy a mobile phone because of the enabled spotlight. Because the family laboratories or toilets are usually detached from the main house. So they will buy it if it doesn't have that torch or spotlight, they will not buy it because that's the main reason. For the others, they would say, I will buy it because I will be able to send and receive money. The famous M Pesa that we know here. M for mobile, Pesa is a Kiswahili term for money. So others will go for that because of the ability for the phone to, 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 to receive money and send money. So reasons are very depending. And then there is, of course, the macro and the macro debates that are key in assembly uh, theory. Ideally, we would imagine that the mobile phone is an individual phone, and it is to some extent. But in my context, there are things that I, I found, although coming from the region, surprising. Because then the phone was no longer individual per se, but had room to be shared. And we will see that shortly. And then, of course, the nature of assemblages, like I said, parts of it can be removed to join another one. Um, so the development in itself that I am fronting for under the word Mayendeleo is a diachronic one. Because the diachronic development looks at uh, development as encompassing complex interactions that cannot be reduced to a bottom-up or top-bottom situation. It is a circulation of relationships in social economic networks, which is of course contrasted to synchronic one, which is central, looking at assemblages, merely studying mobile phone as a communication device only and so on and so forth. But this brings about the complexity that I was interested in. Now I'll take us to the cases of assemblages now. Uh, there are many things discussed in the book, but I would love to highlight these four, uh, which in my opinion stood out for me. One is the mobile phone sharing. Um, like I said, this was a pleasant surprise or maybe a shock <laughs> uh, because the phone could belong to one person, but then that phone could be shared in many ways. You could share the phone in terms of borrowing the handset or you have a SIM, the special identification number. So you have your SIM card, but you, since you don't have the handset, you go to person B who has the handset 
you insert your SIM card and you do your business. Once you're done, retrieve your SIM card and you're free to go. So temporarily you had a phone. And then there is the sharing in terms of top up card or call time. <laughs> so if someone one had a mobile phone and their talk time was less, they would say, they would tell to the other one, oh, I don't have to, uh, talk, um, talk time, could I use your phone? So they would borrow to use because the other one has say 100 shillings is our term we use here for our currency, 100 shillings and 20. So the other one say, I only have 20, that may not sustain two minutes talk. Can I use your phone? So they could share it that way. Or someone can say, since I have loaded my phone with 100 shillings, you have a minute to talk to. At least I need my, or my phone back and something like that. Some people could share it with money uh, at a cost or they can just share for free. So the owner or the custodian of the mobile phone handset can play the role of being the supplier <laughs> shortly because you can give the, the gadget if they're using the SIM or the top up, but you can also give your handset to be used because of the charge. The, 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 the how charged is the phone, the battery. So, and again, we'll be, I'll be telling us how that happens in this context shortly as well. And so these in itself are the forms of mobile phone sharing that happens in this context. If you look at these three young men, I hope you are able to see that they are holding two mobile phones. There's a darker one here and there is a light blue. Now, at the time I was collecting this data, the light blue phone did not have charger, but this other one had been charged properly and had the talk time. So these boys here were listening to a radio uh, broadcast. And because of the nature of the place, there's something here, I don't know whether you're able to see, um, it's trying to create an antenna of some sort so that you can get receptivity. So these boys will listen to the talk, so, uh, talk show, but if in any case there will be a question, they want to chip in and say something, then they will come back to this other phone. Uh, at that time, if they have talked it up, then they will call, uh, what we call call in to the radio station and contribute. The time I was collecting this data, there was a, a hot political topic on who should be elected, the next president, and they were very active, actively involved. Now, so like I said, uh, the mobile phone had sharing uh, kind of refuted the claim that mobile phone is an individual phone because it can be a group phone. Uh, where the, the mobile phone was the phone in majority of the homes, that was it actually. So there was no landline so that the phone came. So there was a leapfrog of some sort. So the phone became the phone. In those cases, the mobile phones stop temporarily their mobi mobile ability and they were put in a basket or somewhere strategic within the home so that anybody who is called and needs to attend to can receive the phone call. So it became a landline. So um, Chebet had something to say and I would like just to read this. He says, people do not share mobile phones just because they do not have enough money. Sometimes people share phones for many reasons, like a low network from uh, Orange, that's one of the suppliers uh, may want someone to borrow one from Safarico. Then again, the issue of charging if one's phone loses charger or she will use another person's phone. So there's that kind of a thing. So you can borrow to use in different ways. The other thing I would want to highlight is the M-Pesa assemblage. Um, so this is the ability to send and receive money via the mobile phone. And it doesn't have to be a digital phone. It can be a feature phone such as this one, or it can be a smartphone such as this, the lady is holding over there, not this one. So uh, as you can see from the pictures here, it brings the whole assembly, the networks around M-Pesa. So here on your left where we have KCB Mtani, this is the link between the mobile phone user and their bank. So because most of the rural communities do not have bank or banking institution, so one can store their money in their phone and connect through the agent number to get their money to their bank accounts. Mostly they would have opened their bank accounts in, in a different city, but this becomes an intermediary, 
uh, this is a connector to their bank. But of course, things have changed now. Uh, sorry, sorry about that. Things have changed now. They're able to send directly from their mobile phone to their bank without necessarily going through the agent. You will see these two ladies. Of course, these are merchandise being bought and sold. No currency is being exchanged, exchanged at least physically. This lady who has already bought some merchandise is sending her money to this other one, who now is trying to confirm that she has received the money. So again, mobile money, uh, uh, doing business there without necessarily that. And then this is where the challenge comes uh, because of uh, rural electrification, not having reached every corner, people have devised ways of, of, of charging their phones. You can see there's a, a myriad of phones here. So sometimes it's, it's a problem knowing which one is which. In fact, I had one, um, I had one participant really express his anger because when he brought his phone for charging here, uh, one of a common friend came, knew his phone, but they had a friend that they had a beef with. So he picks the phone and calls the other one and runs all bad things and takes all matter of these, assuming that the one receiving is, the owner of the phone is the one texting, yet it was someone else. So by the time they are meeting with the said friend, it's like, what kind of text was this you're sending me? What did you send this from? When did this, it's like, I have not gone to pick my phone. When they followed, of course, they noticed somebody came, picked the phone, noticed they were common friends and decided to settle their scores. So it's not safe in itself, but yeah, so it, people have to make do with what they have. And then the third feature I would want to focus on is the core presence. Usually when we are doing core presence engagement, we imagine a small group of people meeting face to face, talking and having really an elaborate time together. But what I found is that the integrity of co-presence has, um, has been compromised with a mobile phone. Because even the mobile phone makes its presence in a meeting. How does the mobile phone make its presence? Even when you put your phone on the table today and it looks all quiet, there's a lot of activity going on. So it's not that innocent. So there are texts coming in, there are texts going out, there are lots coming in, the charge is being recorded, you're going short of something. So there's a lot of activity going on. So, um, so that these meetings, because of what I had said earlier, that this is a community that is still structured around clan leadership, this community home, uh, I forget the name of the animal, um, they would blow this horn today in the 21st century. Can you believe that? So they would blow this horn, but when they blow this horn, it would signal, it would have different sounds. There is a sound that says we have pest infestation in our farms, or sound that says that we have been attacked by the neighboring community. They have stolen the animals or they are making their way. Or one that says, let us congregate for a development meeting under this particular place. And so I was interested to know, now that this is still in use, does that, does the, has the mobile phone replaced this uh, manner of communication? And it has not. So what it does is that it complements. So once the, the, the blower has blown, and it's also a designated person, it's not anybody who blows it, <laughs> because then they have to get those sounds correctly. Then they are, once they hear the sound, now they start texting each other. Have you had or visiting each other? So the mobile phone became um, an augmenter of some sort. So it, it, it reached out beyond, the, so the voice will proceed and then the other one will follow. But then I also noticed that in the core presence, there were a number of things that were happening. And so I, 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 I have just highlighted two quotes here. Many of those are in the book. But these quotes were from the people I would imagine are significant. One was a civil servant working in a different county, and the other one was a sitting legislator. So uh, the civil servant had this to say, and he said, uh, I'm working in Pika, Kiambu County. Before the mobile phones came here, I could not call my wives. I have three wives, and then he notes where these ones are. But then he says, 
I cannot turn it off. My boss could just call me for any inquiries or emergency. This thing, now pointing to the mobile phone, has made it easier to do so much in a short time, and you also do not have to be there physically. So this is one person who was working in a different county, but when he needs to talk to his wives, which he says are three, he would make sure that he calls using the mobile phone, makes it on loudspeaker, and everybody has to talk to their husband and their children. So the core presence was necessitated by the mobile phone, even though this person was not there. And then, of course, we have the area legislator who says uh, he pities those who came before her because for her, she has what he, she calls the personal assistance in every village. Whenever she wants to be in a baraza, which is a Kiswahili town for a meeting place, he would call the uh, PS and they would put her phone next to a speaker. And so she will speak to these community elders and leadership seated together, although she's in Nairobi, which is like 400 kilometers away. And then, so she would have a conversation one hour, two hours with these people for not having to travel. So that in itself also brought the issue of time and distance and space uh, uh, redefinition. Finally, is the power and gender uh, dynamic or assemblage uh, in the place. Now, what happened traditionally is that uh, in most of in the community that I come from, when a male has initiated or has been initiated, of course, has gone through circumcision, that's what happens in this part of the world, then he would move from the family home and they build him a different separate home because the idea is now a big man, is an adult. But it's not the same case for the women. For the girl, child will stay with the parents and will only move out when she's being married off or when she has gotten work and therefore lives elsewhere. And so these girls, uh, they are a mixture. Some of the, this one is in the university, the others in high school. There was one who was finishing uh, upper primary. So their reaction was different in the way mobile phone is conceptualized by the community and they felt that they are somewhat disadvantaged. So the gender disparity is still seen in the ownership. This girl says, if there is a mobile phone to be bought, the first person to be considered would be a male child, even though that male child may not be leader per se, but just because he's male, he will have the access to the mobile phone. Then there was the issue of access, that when, when there's need to use a mobile phone, they would rather give it to a boy child than them. But then the girl said when they have gone to their universities and they're using the mobile phone, some of the universities do not allow it. So they designed ways of being mischievous around it. So they would go to the toilet at the wee <laughs> hours of the night and make the phone calls to their significant others, then turn it off and come and be at the good girl back. And so, and this also was seen in the female cohort, those who are married or single. And they found that although they are the majority who goes to the farm to, um, of course, to cultivate and get the resources, but once money is brought, they bring to the table and it is the man to decide uh, how to, to share the, the hard and sweat of the woman between the resources that uh, are in the house and otherwise. And the women at that time were telling me, this is really not good because when the money comes, the husbands would use for local brew. And so there's no saving and they would not meet the needs. But what they did is they came up with their own, what I would call mischievous assemblages. So they would, some of course, would get into transactional relationship. So, um, in exchange for pleasure, they would get money. And that money would be used to meet the needs in the home. So they would have extramarital affairs for those who are married. Others will have a strict secret drama. And then I told them, but then, are you not afraid you'll be caught? This is what they said. No, if my boyfriend is John, I'll save his name as Jed. So all my husband will see is all female names. But all I know is that it's so and so. How about the text messages? or oh, when you receive money from them, because M-Pesa comes with a text message. What they said is that when they, are, they need to transact, they will go to their friends or they go to use a different SIM so that their husband cannot trace their mischief. 
So there was power negotiation and gender relations even seen throughout this in terms of mobile phone sharing, the access on ownership, is the mischief assemblages. And so all these could be seen in how they were translated. So it was not enough to say because they have the mobile phone, therefore their lives have improved, that they have developed, but that their development was defined as they understood it. Uh, some of them felt that they have experienced development now because they are able to access information on the phone and they would not have done in the past. They have a development which they call Mindeleo because they are able to ask somebody to bring them some merchandise from the shop without them going and sort them later. That they have experienced Mindeleo because now they are able to talk to their children who are in the urban center and they don't have to travel. That they have experienced Mindeleo because they are able to receive and send money. So Mindeleo was as defined and as experienced by them. Then there's the whole question of techno-social transformation and development, which I've already spoken about it. So the mobile phone is both good and bad, generally speaking, and there are these quotes are put here, but it's showing that uh, it is dependent on the user, the context, and the need that is at hand. So when they are making that, uh, that, that, that definition of whether the mobile phone is a great thing or a bad thing, Will largely depend on how they're using it. And I have quotes here from, let me highlight this one for Puskong 39. And he said, my, my mobile phone is both good and bad, but mostly good because the person using it can decide how to use it. Of course, the same can be argued, it can be mostly bad because still the person can decide how to use it. Uh, so the materiality is not limited to face-to-face -to -face conversation as I've, I've spoken about in terms of the, of, of the core presence, but interpersonal networks are structuring the communities is what really uh, picks that big time. In my earlier work in 2020, I mean, latest work, I found that the assemblage components that play material role, uh, mobile phone, as an object and a device, but it's also the rich networks of human bodies and their interaction within the mobile telephony, but there's also the range of cultural and social institutions. I just mentioned the issue of clan leadership and how that controls how people meet where they meet. Co-presence uh, is both an occasion and a relation. And this I, I found to really tally well with the works of earlier scholars, Callan and Law. So it was both a location, but also a relation. So Mindeleo is a diachronic kind of development which appreciates the complexity of the reality. As I draw this towards a conclusion, uh, so why should you consider this book? I think you should consider this book for a number of reasons. One is the appreciation of the context of scholarship. I'm sure you've picked some books where you come from, like I have here, and, and the context looks so far removed. But once you have the author and the face and the context, you're able to appreciate some realities better. It contributes to the discourse of information communication technologies for sustainable development, gender and development, new media and mobile communication, and so on and so forth. So there is a contribution to the discourse around these big things. And so this book makes a contribution in that regard. And I think on that front, you may want to consider that. It's also an opportunity to put a face to scholarship. At least through this screen, you can say, I know the author of that book somehow. <laughs> there are other discourses in this book, which uh, I expounded more. The question of gender and power, time and space redefinition is explored more in the book, more than I have just highlighted. And, and I think that, that that's a good thing. The mobile communication in this book can no longer be ignored, uh, seeing that the convergence of media is now into the mobile phone. If you need the camera, if you need the audio, if you need to reference, if you need to whatever, everything seems to be coming back to this small gadget or big gadget, depending on what kind of phone you have. So there's a convergence. So these in a sense augments the place of mobile phone as a new converge technology. 
And then of course the implication of mobile phone can no longer be ignored. Looking at how lives have been transformed, the research into mobile communication has touched many facets. There are people who are able to access healthcare. There are people who are able to access education. There are those who are accessing agricultural information through the mobile phone, uh, courtesy of extension agricultural work. And so it's big. Mobile phone may be small, miniature in, in touch, but great in what it is doing. My final thought, I think Africa scholarship needs attention. Uh, time to have people talk about other people, I think needs to reduce so that we can hear voices from the people in the context. One time I ran into one book at SOAS because I was staying right at the heart, King's Cross. And I read that book and I thought, did this person really find this from this context? I felt like it was strange the way it was written. And so I think it's important that we hear voices from the ground. That's the authenticity that we are looking for. Uh, and sometimes you can't blame the people who have come to collect data from us because there's also the issue of translation uh, distortion along the way. So there's need to support publishers who give voice to African voices. And I think you would say the same from your context as well. For me, I found Langa publishers are uh, great because they gave me the opportunity to publish with them. Actually, they sought for me, which was a good thing. Uh, I think we should pen down our stories. The world needs to hear us loud and clear. And to fight marginalization of developing world, I think we must stand together. And so you are never too old to set another goal or dream again. So kudos to you, Ula. God bless you. And that will be it from my end. Thank you. Sakar. Hello. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Leia, for your uh, wonderful discussion. And I would say that uh, telling stories of your work, your experiences, and as you said, that stories behind the stories. Uh, I uh, enjoyed the session very much. Uh, I hope the audience also did the same. So I think uh, now we can go for a question answer session. So uh, dear audience, if you have any question, Please uh, turn on your video and uh, ask the question. Also, like if you are not comfortable with turning on video, you can still ask the question. No questions? Also, you can write your question in the chat box if you want to. I can ask them a question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You can, you I can, can ask them a maybe, question. Maybe, maybe that's a good way to uh, do the conversation. Yes. All the time, you know, audience asks the question. So, yeah, it could yeah, be the other way around as well. Around. Like the that's teachers true. asking question after uh, delivering a lecture. 
Sure. I wanted to know, and this goes to the floor, not necessarily you, whether any there is any similar similarities in the experiences I've spoken about to your realities in Bangladesh. Are there things that are common or uncommon even? Okay, uh, Dr. Le, maybe I, I can share uh, my knowledge a bit on this. So, uh, you know, Bangladesh is uh, also a developing country and uh, just a few years back, many of the rural areas were not connected uh, to the national grid and many places did not have uh, electricity you know, some places they had uh, limited access to electricity. For example, they would have maybe six to 12 hours of electricity per day, but there were places uh, you know, uh, in islands, uh, which we called chor. Okay, in, in, in a Bengali language, we call it chor. So the uh, sandy part of the sandy islands uh, inside the river or uh, in the uh, sea. So in, in those areas there, uh, was no electricity until a few years back in, in most, most such places. Now it is, uh, we have electricity coverage uh, to even uh, most such remote places. Uh, but you know, if you go back 10 uh, to 15 years, then you know, the scenario was uh, completely different. Now the people there also used uh, mobile phone back in those days. And sometimes you know, they would uh, travel a few kilometers to go to the nearest place where they can charge their phone. Okay. And, and they will come back. Sometimes you know, they would need to go through the river, sometimes you know, a very muddy village roads in the rainy season, especially. And that's how uh, people uh, use mobile phone. And of course, you know, the changes, in, especially in a rural life, uh, also, I think in urban life everywhere, uh, the technological disruptions changed uh, life uh, as a whole a lot. And uh, of course, in all places you will see, uh, you will hear from people that there are both good and uh, bad sides of uh, mobile phone. Like you know, uh, one of your respondents, uh, the representative, he was saying that he could talk to his wives through a conference call. That is his uh, advantage uh, that, that uh, he is getting from mobile phone, but at the same time, he cannot turn it off. And like he is becoming more easily available to his senior or his boss. And uh, like if he turns it off, then there will be probably a gap in communication. Probably there will be even uh, suspicion, lack of trust. Uh, those also happen. I think these are similar experiences. And if I, if I consider my own uh, view, 20 years ago when I was a student uh, at the very early stage of my undergrad study, uh, not 20, I think that's 22 years, so in early 2000. Uh, back then, you know, mobile phone was booming in Bangladesh and the number of subscribers were increasing, but I still was not so much eager to carry a mobile phone. Even being an urban kid, an urban kid, I, I was not so eager to be a, carry a mobile phone because I felt uh, that yes, it has its advantages, but uh, sometimes you know it has its uh, disadvantages as well. Uh, sometimes it uh, makes people more easily available, and uh, sometimes there are even irritations uh, with uh, such availability. So yeah, uh, we can uh, quite connect uh, to the rural life and. Uh, on the other hand, if we look into the life of our farmers, uh, life of our fisher folks, of course, they are having tremendous uh, development in their profession, like uh, for selling their goods, the, they did not have any idea that how the market is. And uh, if uh, they come to the market with their products today, what kind of price they can get. And now as they have mobile phones, uh, they can follow up the market very easily, time to time. And so that they can decide on when to harvest. If you know some uh, crops, they can harvest a couple of days early or a week late, uh, that doesn't make much difference. 
So in, in such cases, they can decide on such information uh, that they can uh, get through the use of mobile phone. Also for the fish, fish and folks, you know, uh, like uh, that they can uh, communicate with the prospective, uh, prospective buyers and then uh, they can accordingly, you know, pick up uh, their products and go to the market or send directly to the buyer, not going to the market. So they can even sometimes bypass the market and a bypassing market would actually cut a lot of cost as well. Yes. So yes, these are, I think in, in if, if you consider the rural life, uh, the experiences will not be much different uh, in Africa in and in uh, rural Bangladesh. In urban area, probably there could be some differences, but there will be similarities as well. Uh, and, and that's uh, what I was actually bearing in mind uh, while I was uh, listening to your discussion, though, you know, uh, it is not really part of uh, your book or your discussion today. Uh, but uh, I had this in mind that uh, I will ask at the end of the discussion that, like, what about the urban spaces in your country, in Kenya? Like uh, uh, how people are uh, affected or uh, like, you know, in Bangladesh, if we consider a lot of people think that the young generations, they are, are getting more and more into mobile phone, which actually are affecting uh, their personal life, their relationships in the physical spaces. And mobile phone, you know, of course, doesn't mean just talking over mobile phone. It, uh, of course, include gaming and use of social media and uh, so many other things. And uh, people are, of course, they're thinking, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic period, when the kids could not go out, a lot of parents were kind of forced to you know, give mobile phones to their kids, especially because of the online classes. And now people are thinking, uh, though you know, I, I do not have any precise data on that, but uh, from my personal observation, I'm saying this, uh, the people around me, uh, they are thinking, they're saying that uh, this disruption actually uh, has become quite harmful for the kids. And they're becoming more and more uh, addicted, quote unquote, uh, to mobile phones, uh, smartphones, and uh, which is, you know, they, of course, uh, taking very negatively. So uh, can you, from your personal experience, or if you have any research data, uh, on your side, can you please shed a bit light on this, the uh, scenario in the urban area in Kenya, especially for the youth? Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, in fact, what you've highlighted seems to, <laughs> to agree with our context here so far. There is, of course, a mixed grill of things. There are those who think the mobile phone is the best thing ever, particularly coming from the young people's um, you know, perspective because they are able to have a mobile phone in their disposal. They are also able to, to use the gadgets, could be iPhone, iPad, whatever, tab tablets that allow the mobility. They are able to access that. They feel like they have been able to research on their own and get stuff on their own. But of course, there was also the other flip side where now uh, the, 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 the risk of addiction so there is so much into the mobile phone. They should say in a meeting, you'll find all the hands, uh, heads about. Everybody's looking at something. And yet they were having a discussion. So it, it does different, definitely interrupted. A study was done in 2020, um, during the thick of the uh, corona in our place. And so a study was done around the country. Actually, it's supposed to uh, East Africa. So a couple of universities, so we are targeting young people. And, and, and the study findings were that when people moved online, it also had different uh, findings. For example, for the people who were introverted, they became more active online. The people who could not speak in classroom were able now to express themselves. They find expression behind a technology and their grades were great. But the people who found expression in the physical setting seems to have dropped back in terms of their performance. But that's only one finding. The other finding was that uh, the cost implication uh, determine how far or how long you spend on a gadget. Because most of these had to use internet and internet had to be purchased, you purchase bundles. 
Many universities had not put that as an investment. So people had, parents had to dig deeper to get more money to buy internet for their uh, kids to continue learning. So that was uh, negative in a sense because other than paying the fees that you've paid, you had to dig deeper to get more internet for your students as well, or your children. Then there was the, the preparedness of the faculty with the mobile technology happening. Many people were in the traditional setting. The finding was, of course, many people were thrown off balance in a sense that not many universities had prepared to do online. Whether this online is via the mobile phone or via the iPad, whatever the gadget it is, they had not prepared for the online reality. And then all of a sudden they've been thrown in there, no skills, and yet they are supposed to help the other, what we call generos, the generation Z, the young people <laughs> to navigate. So that was a bit of an upset, a pyramid. So the one who is supposed to know doesn't know. And the one who should not know knows. So who should be teaching who? There was that kind of a thing. Then there's, there's also the fact that uh, with the mobile phones now, that became the easiest for the primary school, the, the younger kids because of couldn't have the laptops. Now that took most of their time because they would always pretend they are doing assignments or they are doing something, but they were doing games, they were having their videos, they were having their movies, God knows what else they were watching. And at some instance, there was the issue of, we need to regulate what they watch. So there's the issue of how much is enough. So yeah, maybe I can stop there for now. Yeah, uh, that is a really a difficult line to draw that how much is enough for, and then and, and for who? You know, that, that is also a big question. Like, and, and, and it is uh, very difficult to draw that line and the line would still be bloody. Uh, when you are talking about this uh, disruption of uh, COVID-19 and uh, education to online, yeah, we, we can uh, talk of the similar experiences in Bangladesh, like a lot of faculty members, they were not really prepared uh, for the online environment. And actually, uh, as you know, we have been traditionally in uh, the physical setup all, all the time. Uh, but we, most of us, we never felt that kind of, you know, importance uh, to get oriented with all these uh, online uh, learning management systems or any other tools that can be used for uh, online education. But luckily at ULAB at our university, we have been using uh, online LMS since 2014 on a regular basis. And that's why uh, proudly saying that we, are, we were the first university to launch online classes in Bangladesh. Uh, the government stopped, the, the government uh, announced the closure of classes uh, in uh, schools and universities on the 18th of March in 2020. Then we went online on 20th March. Just one day we did not do anything. We discussed what to do and uh, we decided and then we went online. And uh, we, we would not say that it was uh, super smooth or we all were very comfortable from the day one. But of course, we were not stuck because we had some orientation uh, regarding this. Also, uh, we did uh, a, a research work, a study among the private university students uh, last year in 2021. Uh, Professor Jude uh, was leading the study and I was there uh, with him and uh, one of uh, my colleagues, Amin Islam. So we three did this and like, you know, it's, it's a mixed bag when it comes to online education, it's a mixed bag. Uh, so some uh, said the positive things and some of course uh, talked about uh, the challenges and especially, you know, the culture of education. Uh, we have been habituated with face-to-face uh, -face learning uh, all the time. And uh, that's, that's how we feel comfortable. So like uh, online, for online, many did not feel comfortable, but on the other hand, just like you said, Many people who were uh, very much introvert could not ask questions uh, in the class because uh, they were all, always hesitant. Where if I ask this question, uh, what the teacher will think that I, I do not know this silly question, the answer of this silly question. Uh, but when, you know, and especially if they can be anonymous, they, they were uh, brave and they asked question 
and then uh, they did well. But one thing that uh, I think was very significant, like when it comes to uh, schooling, it's not only about uh, teaching and learning. It's also about building the sense of community. Like, you know, uh, when you are going to school with your classmates, you do not only uh, take the lectures from your professors, or you do not listen to the lessons from your teachers. Uh, and uh, you have the spare time between classes, then you uh, hang out with the, the people in your class or uh, elsewhere. Uh, so you sense, you, you build a sense of community. You actually build a community there. So uh, most of the students actually talked about this, that uh, they are no longer having that sort of sense. Uh, like they feel sometimes alienated and, you know, of course, uh, when you were stuck at home and having all the online classes uh, as the window of outside, there will be fatigue at, at some point. And I think that's a syndrome the whole world suffered with uh, for the last two years. But uh, let's hope that uh, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, will be over soon. Uh, we have uh, started our uh, on-campus classes this semester from uh, the last week of uh, February, the semester started. Uh, and uh, we hope we will be able to continue. Uh, one more thing I, I am curious about that, uh, like you were talking about uh, multiple users of the same cell phone. And of course, when you know, more than one user may use a cell phone, then uh, there might be issues that create a dispute between the users. So uh, what about that? Is there any insight? You're talking about the, the privacy yeah. and security? Are you talking about the privacy? Yeah, privacy. Yeah, yeah. And security of data. Yeah, that will always be a challenge because even when you are using the mobile money, chances are you could send to someone and it could go to a wrong um, destination, so to speak. In the past, when I was collecting this data, which was in 2012, the problem was the, the service provider, Safaricom, at that time had not designed ways of recovering it real quick. So you could send money and it goes to a wrong destination and the person that has gone, gotten the money went right away and used the money. The only way the service provider is able to recover money for you is if that person uh, puts money on their phone. So they keep taking from that, which was a long journey. So there was a real appro, but now uh, in 2019, 2018, 2017 actually, they designed a way in which if it goes to the wrong person, all you need to do is press any key in the mobile phone and it will stop the transaction. So that has helped recover some money. But before many people lost huge money <laughs> because of that. So there's the issue of privacy will, which will continue. Even with this one of pressing every key, it is not good to everybody else. Think about somebody who didn't understand that. Of course, it is skewed to the literate those who are able to read and write, those who can hear, you know, if, if you are deaf, then what? If you're what, then what? So it still has to uh, continue to marginalize a few people, so to speak. But there's a whole question of privacy of data that remains to be a pain, not just in Kenya, I think it's across because of the micro macro debate I say. So if I send a text to you, in my heart of hearts, it came to you. But the truth is, it could have gone to anybody else. It is using the cloud and God knows where else. So it's not from me to you, it's from me to whoever cares to see. So <laughs> there's yeah. also that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you so much, Dr. Leah, for sharing your uh, experiences uh, with us. And uh, so I would uh, ask again, if there is any question from the audience. If not, probably we can go for conclusion. No question? Okay, then uh, let's proceed with the closer of this session and of course uh, also 
closer uh, of the day. So, of course, I will start by thanking you, uh, Dr. Leah, uh, for your time in uh, this uh, engaging discussion uh, on your book. Uh, I think uh, the audience uh, has learned a lot about you know, the technological disruption in, in rural Kenya and uh, its uh, impact on their lives, both the positive and negative sides. And uh, that brings us uh, to the end of uh, day two of uh, Dhaka Media Summit uh, 2022. And uh, we can probably wrap it up uh, by calling it a successful day full of engaging conversations. We had three roundtable discussions in the first part of the day. Uh, we started with uh, the roundtable discussion uh, focusing on communication modalities and audience engagement in the network environment, followed by another roundtable discussion, Citizens of Today and Tomorrow, Digital Literacy and Digital Etiquette in Secondary Curriculum. Later on, we had another roundtable discussion on media sustainability and safety concerns uh, for journalists in Nepal and beyond. After the break, we came back with a research panel uh, where our colleagues from LSPR uh, Communication and Business Institute presented uh, their research insights on uh, digital media in Indonesia audience access and communications. Afterwards, we had another uh, panel from Pelitaharapan University, Indonesia, titled the panel titled Digital Media Power and Contestation in Contemporary Indonesia. And finally, we had uh, your uh, book discussion, uh, Dr. Lea, Mobile Assemblages and uh, Mendeleo in Rural Kenya. And I see that uh, the second part, especially the second part, uh, of course, the first part also had the uh, similar things, the technological disruption in different spheres of life, uh, be it media, be it school, be it our uh, personal spaces, be it activism, everywhere, there are uh, in every spheres of life and society, we see all these uh, disruptions made by uh, digital technologies. And uh, so our life is changing, of course. And uh, of course, it is very important to uh, look into such issues. Uh, and uh, with this, let us conclude uh, today's session. Tomorrow, we'll start uh, at uh, 10 as usual. And uh, uh, I hope you will be with us. So uh, let us conclude here the day two, uh, the Dhaka Media Summit 2022, jointly organized by University of Liverpool Arts Bangladesh and International Association for Media and Communication Research, IAMCR. Thank you. I bid you all a good night.